so I think I am going live. I am. I, I think I'm live, and I saw some of you are already in the chat. So um, just somebody confirm that you can hear me, <laughs> and then I will get started. Okay, good, excellent. This is always the most nerve-wracking part of doing a live stream is believing that anybody uh, can see me. It's cocktail time in Raleigh. It'll be cocktail time here <laughs> when this live stream is over. Okay, and I wanna make sure the sound levels are good too. I've had, um, it was a little low a couple of live streams ago, but everyone's saying loud and clear. So that's wonderful. So uh, what I wanna tell you, I'm gonna just kinda get going and tell you guys um, what my plan is for this particular live stream because short rows is a pretty broad and deep topic. And there's a lot of confusion about how short rows work and just understanding what you're doing. I think I was doing projects with short rows for about four years, like trying to understand what was going on. I was picking projects that had uh, different ways of doing short rows and I just didn't understand like how how was it that sometimes the short rows were longer and longer and other times they would make them shorter and shorter and how did they make that decision and so I did have a revelation at one point I sat down and thought to myself if I wanted to design something with short rows and I wanted it to look a certain way, what would I do? And I started drawing things out. And then I was able to understand what was going on. And even then, it has taken you know, some time to really think about in particular situations, what I do it this way versus what I do it that way. So what I'm gonna do, what I'm gonna start out with is I'm going to show you guys some projects that I have knit that have short rows in them that may not be typical or maybe unusual that you might not have seen before. In Tuesday's Technique Tuesday video, I showed some pretty standard ways that short rows are used. And um, so I thought I would show you some ways that I have used them um, that maybe you haven't seen before or that might look unusual. Um, so, um, so I'm gonna show, do that. And then I went back and I looked at the, the comments when I first asked you guys if you wanted a live stream on short rows. And I looked at the comments. Most of them were just, yes, I want a, a a live stream on short rows, but some of you had some specific things that you wanted to understand better. And so I'm going to try to, to answer those questions as uh, best I can in this sort of environment. Um, some of that might be uh, material that would it, become a Technique Tuesday video where I can really go through the process and film it over a period of time and then edit it down so that it makes it more understandable. Um, so I'm going to go through those, and then I'll also uh, field questions from you guys. So, so just to be clear, I may have some specific answers for you, and sometimes they may be a little bit more vague, and I may be able to direct you to a resource that would, that would allow you to work through the answers. So let's first, let me just look and see everybody um, who's here today. Oh, and the other thing I'll be able to do when I take a question um, from you guys, if you have a question, if you would type the word question before your actual question. So type question and then, and then type whatever it is. Because I have a, um, a better way right now of seeing the chat than I had before and it will highlight the word question in yellow and I'll be able to see it. And then I can click on that and it will show up on the screen so you guys can read the question as well. So that's something to keep in mind if you have questions um, as we go along. So we've got people from California, Arkansas, Albuquerque, Georgia, Poland. You know, it's so late for you guys. Germany, Minneapolis, Hawaii, Greece, late for you guys too. Brisbane, Australia, very early for you guys. Yorkshire, UK, Spain. Is anybody, it's so funny how many people are from outside the US. UK, Southern California, more UK. Um, more UK, 
So that is great. It's so nice. Oh, New Zealand. Good morning to you in New Zealand. Prince Edward Island, New York. Question. Do I have videos? Well, I'll show you an example of how this is going to work. I'm going to take that and let's see if it worked. Did it work? There we go. So here's an example of the question. Do I have any videos on double knitting? Um, and the answer to that is not exactly. No, I do not. So, um, but this is an example of how that will work if you type the word question. So let me get started with, um, with an overhead and showing you guys some of these uh, projects and just how they work. So let me switch to the overhead. And I will do some zooming. You can see all my equipment here. Okay. So I believe I showed this in the video on Tuesday where this is a pretty standard type of sweater that uses, um, that has set in sleeves. So this is not a yoke sweater. This is not a raglan sweater. This is a sweater where you have a front and a back and you have seams or some kind of a join at the shoulder and the sleeves are set in so it's a very it's a much more tailored look to um, to a sweater so in the Tuesday video I was showing how there is this angle here so there's short row shaping but I also used short rows for the sleeve I worked the sleeve top down by picking up stitches all the way around the armhole and then a sleeve cap is shaped like Kind of like this so it's narrower at the top and it gets wider it's kind of like a bell shape so this is where the short rows begin up here and they're very short and they gradually get longer and longer and longer and so it fills in this cap at the top so you get all of this all of the length for all of the rows is right here and it's narrower over here and that's that's what short rows do they add length across some of the stitches but not all of the stitches are on the needle. So all of the stitches are live and only some of the columns of stitches are getting more rows. So that's, that's one example. So this is a, a sweater I knit for myself years ago. So this part right here is like a regular hat. It's about eight inches long right here, something like that. But if you look at the ribbing, you'll see that it's very narrow at this end, but much longer at that end. That allows me to wear this on my head, and this part is longer, and so this can hang down the back of my head. So it's a way of doing a slouchy hat without making the entire hat long, um, and so, so that it doesn't bunch up underneath on the head there. So I did a a similar thing to, for a, a hat for my husband where I knit a really long uh, ribbed uh, uh, ribbing for him and so that it was actually a little narrower on the uh, across the forehead and wider at the back so it would be more ear coverage here so it could be done either way you can um, but the idea with the short rows is that you're creating more length right here and less length right here. And so you do that by working across only some of the stitches. So this is a blanket that I knit. This is a pattern from, from Knitty. And there are a lot of other types of patterns that are based on this. This is called the Lizard Ridge Blanket. And it can be done by working them in squares or by working the entire width of the blanket um, in one color. And what's going on is that you have two, you have one ball of Noro Curion yarn, which is a slow color changing yarn. And you, you use one end of the ball of yarn um, to knit uh, one stripe. And when you're done with that stripe, you use the other end of the ball, which is a different color. So these are really stripes, but they're stripes uh, where you are working short rows. So as you work across, you work across a couple of rows and you come in here and then you're working back and forth in shorter rows and longer rows. And then you work to, to the next one. And so you're creating more length in each of these bubbles. And so, you're, and so then when you're working with the other end of the ball, 
you're offsetting those bubbles. So this is another way of using short rows. And you can see there's a little bit of dimensionality. It almost looks like uh, an egg crate um, looking here, looking uh, fabric in this. But there are patterns that use this, um, projects that use this kind of uh, stitch pattern on, that you can find on Ravelry. A lot of times they're Lizard Ridge dishcloth or Lizard Ridge hat or Lizard Ridge this or that or the other thing. So it's a fun way. It's a little bit more complicated way of using short rows, but it's a really interesting way to use short rows for decorative effect. The overall squares are the same length the same length on both edges of the square, but because you're offsetting those short rows, you can create this decorative effect. And then this is a sweater that I wear every so often on my YouTube videos, but you can't always see what's actually going on. So if you see that there are all these short uh, or narrow stripes over here, um, but then on this side, they're really wide. So this is a cardigan that's knit fronts and back are all knit in one piece. So as you knit this uh, narrow stripe across and then you're going to the back of the sweater, and you come back around to the front and then you're on your return voyage, you don't work all the way back, you stop. You work a short row, you go back, you come back again, you work a little bit longer, you go back, come back a little bit longer, and that creates more length at this end of the stripe, creates a wider stripe, and gradually the stripes end up moving down um, the sweater in this kind of radiant uh, way. So this is a, a sweater pattern that's called Stripes Gone Crazy, and it was a really interesting um, sweater to knit. It's just an ingenious construction and ingenious use of short rows. Okay, so let me go back to base and I'm going to start answering uh, some of the questions that I got. So I want to start with just short row techniques. One of the questions was which type of, of techniques have specific uses? So what this question is referring to is that when you do a short row turn, if you just turn and go back the other way, that's a simple term. And if you are working in stockinette fabric, you're going to get kind of a bump in the fabric. You're going to get a little uh, bump at that turning point and a bit of a hole as well. And so the whole point of short row techniques is to prevent that kind of lumpy, bumpy look to keep the fabric very smooth. So there are different types of short row techniques. One is that you could just turn and slip the stitch and go back in the other direction and that would kind of reduce that bumpy look. Um, but there's a, a type of short row called wrap and turn short row, which when I started doing short rows, that was really the only method that was ever in patterns. People were creating blog posts and tutorials on how to use other types of short row techniques so you didn't have to use a wrap and turn. Um, and, and so people would learn to substitute them, but you didn't see patterns that use them. And then once you started getting more independent designers and people able to sell their patterns online, you'd see a lot more independent designers using different types of short row techniques. So people were discovering those short row techniques and really liking them and then wanting to know, well, how do you use them in another pattern? Or how do you know if maybe there's a reason why they use that particular short row technique? So what I would say is that the wrap and turn short row has every, well, every short row, short row technique has advantages and disadvantages, but the wrap and turn uh, has advantages that other techniques don't have. And that is you can wrap the stitch across from where you're turning uh, at the point that you, you know, do your turn. When you come back, you don't have to pick up that wrap. If you were working in stockinette fabric, it will appear like a pearl bump on your fabric, and so that will be visually disruptive. But if you're working in a fabric like seed stitch or garter stitch, or even if you are working in a cabled fabric, so you have columns of pearl stitches, you can just wrap that stitch and never have to pick it up because that wrap will hide in the fabric. The whole point of picking up a wrap in a wrap and turn short row is to hide that wrap 
on the back of the fabric when you are working in stockinette. You don't have to pick up that wrap. It, the picking up the wrap isn't what prevents a hole. Picking up the wrap is what hides that strand of yarn to the back of the fabric. So, so that's an advantage of wrap and turn short rows is that you don't have to pick them up in some situations. As far as I can think of, every other type of short row technique when you apply that technique at the turn, you have to deal with it when you return. So if you are do using a yarn over a short row, uh, you have a yarn over on the needle that you have to get rid of, otherwise you will have increased a stitch. If you are working a German short rows, which create a double stitch on the needle, you have to work that double stitch. It's very easy to work the double stitch, but you have to do it. Um, and then there is shadow wraps, which create what are called a twin stitch. And again, you have to eliminate that twin stitch. But with wrap and turn, you don't have to do anything upon that turn. And in some cases, that can be a decorative effect. I've also used um, short rows. There is a little um, stuffed like bird on Ravelry. I think it's called uh, something like Little Bluebird or Bluebird of, ha of Paradise or Bluebird of Happiness, something like that. It's a little, it's like a little cat toy. And it uses wrap and turn short rows and the instructions do not tell you to pick up the wraps. And I substituted German short rows. I realized when I was knitting this and I was using my German short rows that there was a reason why they had specified wrap and turn and why they said not to pick them up. And that was because there was a place where they were forming the head, this rounded shape of the head with short rows. And they were having you turn at that same turning point every single time, which is really unusual. And they were having you wrap every single time. And then once you continued on with the longer short rows, what I realized was those wraps were forming um, the eye of the bird, it was like a decorative effect to have the kind of this fan of these wraps going around. And they also use them along the body to form the outline of the wings. So very occasionally there is a definite reason why a specific short row is used, but it's not always apparent up front. Sometimes you get through the project, then you realize, oh, this is why um, they chose that. I will say, the disadvantage of wrap and turn short rows, in my opinion, is that they are the hardest type of short row to actually uh, deal with the technique when you return to it. So you, you, wrap, you wrap a stitch, you continue working your short rows, and you come back and you're, you're create, going on a longer row where you're getting to where the wrap is and you have to pick up that wrap. That is the hardest a technique to deal with. A German sh uh, short rows, you, it's a double stitches on the needle, you just work those together. Uh, sh uh, twin uh, Shadow wraps, which have a twin stitch, same thing, you just work them together. A yarn over is sitting on the needle, you just work it together with the stitch that's on the needle. So the other kinds of techniques are much easier um, to, to work when you are going back past that original turning point. So let's see, um, somebody was asking about substituting techniques and sp uh, specifically they had asked about substituting uh, a wrap and turn short row but and using German short rows instead. I actually have done a video on a couple of videos that are, I think are useful um, w in order to make those kinds of substitutions. One is just a comparison of short row techniques where it shows all of the different ones and can kind of what's happening with them uh, and comparing them and showing that there's kind of two families of short row techniques and you need to be aware of that when you are doing substitutions. It doesn't mean you can't substitute a technique from one family um, for a technique in the other family. It's just that you need to be aware of, of, of how they're different fundamentally. So I would really recommend those two videos. I do have a playlist of short row techniques on my channel and I believe that I linked to that down in the video description for the live stream that I have a link to that playlist. And you can look through, you can see the one that's comparing short row techniques. And then there's one on making those substitutions so that you can really understand um, how, how to figure that out. 
Okay. So one of the questions, um, there are, uh, there were a number of questions that on the surface sounded quite different but actually all come down to the same thing, which is figuring out how to calculate the number of short rows you need and how often those turns ought to be. So that's what I'm going to uh, talk about now. I'm gonna do, go back to the overhead. I'm gonna draw you guys some pictures. Okay. So, oh. Let's see, well, let's see if I turn this like this, then I can be over here under the camera better. Okay, and I just need to take a sip of drink. Okay, so short rows is a shaping technique. It's a vertical shaping technique that allows you to add more length to some of the stitches uh, without adding length to the others. So, um, so let's just draw a picture. And let's say we have, um, a piece of fabric right here. Uh, let's say, and let's say what we want to do is we want to add an extra inch. So that's something that sometimes people want to do. They want to add an extra inch of fabric on the back of their sweater. Um, maybe not, I'm not talking necessarily up here at the shoulders, but maybe further down the back, they might want to add a little bit more length. Um, or if you're wanting to do bust starts or something like that, you're wanting to add more length across some of the stitches. So let's just say, uh, let's look at a couple of different scenarios. Um, let's just say we wanna add an inch of length along here, one inch, and this works in centimeters too. You can just use your centimeters. You wanna add an, an inch of length. Well, first of all, you need to know what your row gauge is. So if you are working in, say, worsted weight, and you are working five stitches per inch and seven rows per inch, one inch is seven rows. With short rows, you really need to work in pairs. So you need an even number of rows. So we'll say that's eight rows. This means we are going to need to work four sets of short rows because we are doing them in pairs. So we have to have four turns. If we're gonna need eight new rows, we have to have four turns. So now we have to look at how many stitches do we have here? So let's say we have, um, let's say we have 40 stitches, that'll make it easy. So we have 40 stitches and we need to do four turns. That means we need to turn every 10 rows. So the first time is we're gonna go across 30 stitches and come back. And then the next time we're gonna go 20 stitches and come back. And then we're gonna go 10 stitches. Did I do that right? No, I did not do that right. We need to go, what am I doing? Two, four, six. I had this all figured out ahead of time and I thought it was different for flat than it was in the round. So, um, just give me a second. Uh, okay. Why would it be that way? So the way that I, okay. So you're gonna have two, three, four. So you're gonna have uh, four turns right here. And it looks like it's gonna be every eight. So you're gonna do 32, 24, 16, and eight. And so that will give you uh, your four turns. And then you go across all of them um, and then you come back. So that's how you calculate the number that you need is first of all, <laughs> you figure out the number uh, that you actually need to make. Um, it works a little bit um, differently. If you're working in the round, you need to establish this point right here if you're working across here. Let's, let's look at another example. 
because you don't always want to have all of the length. Um, you don't always want it to be uh, narrow right there. You could have uh, a situation where you might want some of it in the middle and then some of it like this. And so you'd be doing sets of short rows back and forth like this. So you'd have um, however many stitches that you have right here. Let's say you have 20 here. Let me start over. Sorry about this, guys. I got, me, I got myself a little flustered. Okay, so the first way I showed was that you are starting with a longer row and then you're getting shorter and you're getting shorter and shorter. So in this case, you get your one inch here and gradually uh, you're getting um, longer and longer as you get toward this one inch. But there are other ways to create a shape where you have one inch on the side and less over here and that is uh, a triangle that has a different shape. So you start with shorter short rows and you gradually get longer and longer short rows. So what this does is it creates fabric that pushes down and so the, the, the shorter fabric is lower and in this situation the shorter fabric is up higher. So if you were doing this at the edge of something near a cast on edge and you started with shorter and shorter short rows that would push those rows down where if you um, are starting or you were near the bind off edge and you wanted it to go out that way you would work your shorter and shorter short rows in this way but there's one more way where you can have something that's an inch like this and that would be something that looks like that so this is the situation where you'd start with shorter short rows and then you'd get the longest one and then you start working shorter and shorter short rows again. So this is the kind, the revelation that I had years ago was when I just sat down and I drew the shape that I wanted and I looked at if I was just drawing horizontal lines inside the shape, are those, are those lines getting longer and longer or are they getting shorter and shorter? So I made myself a little swatch um, and I used a slow changing yarn um, to try it out. So I started out with some garter stitch and I, what I did was I, I just planned out a little drawing where I thought, well, if I have eight or 10 rows right here and, and I, I make them shorter and shorter every five and then I work a row of garter stitch back and forth, I can get this sort of triangular shape in the fabric. Well, then what happens? Well, then I can come across and I can work uh, across starting over here and making these longer and longer this way and then shorter and shorter that way. So I just started playing with the shapes to see how I could keep this fabric straight but working these different short rows. And then I started looking at well what if I didn't try to offset them? What if I used the same kind of wedge each time? Then you can get this kind of uh, a curve effect. And actually, let me stand up and get one of these off of here. There's a, a dishcloth, some dishcloth um, patterns that use that technique where you're basically, you're just doing wedges and that allows you uh, to create a circle. Um, so this is a, a fun way of working with short rows um, as well. So let me just, can I demonstrate a wrap and turn please? Okay, I'm just gonna check in on with questions right now. Okay, so 
uh, I'm going to get get to your questions. Some of the questions you're having are things that I was already planning um, on talking about. So let me see. One of the questions that that um, let me check back to here. So one of the questions that somebody has was, how do you deal with short rows when you also have a stitch pattern? And that gets trickier. As you try to combine techniques in any situation, the more techniques you're trying to juggle at one time, the more complicated things can get. So um, I, I had a couple of questions about uh, adding short rows to yoke sweaters. And one of the questions was, uh, does that matter? What's the difference between putting them at the bottom of the yoke versus having them up at the neck? And some of that answer is aesthetics and sometimes it can be uh, a matter of trying to deal with the stitch pattern. And where can you place those short rows so that they're gonna be least disruptive to the stitch pattern and also create an aesthetically pleasing result. So there's really kind of three ways that you can add short rows um, to a yoke. Now, I don't knit yoke sweaters. So what I know about adding short rows to yoke sweaters is based on just looking at what people have done and reading things in books and looking at how the calculations were done. So uh, I can recommend um, this book right here, Knitting in the Old Way. This is a book that has various types of traditional sweaters, including a variety of different yoke style sweaters. And they explain to you the proportions of them, like how you can calculate the number of stitches you need for the sleeves and what percent, you know, what total percentage you have of the body. Like if you have 100% for the body, um, then you have 138% when the sleeves are included. And so they have different ways of, they sh illustrate different ways of adding short rows to the yoke. So one of them is at the bottom and the short row, the, the shortest short rows end where the sleeves are separating and the longer ones um, extend like five stitches more each time. So. If you're using a bulky weight yarn, you might have three sets of short rows. So you might have six rows, which if you're using a bulky weight yarn, that's probably about an inch that you're adding to the length. Where if you're using a medium to finer weight yarn, you would have five sets of short rows, which would give you, you know, an inch to an inch and a half, depending on exactly what your row gauge is. So, so, and in, in those cases at the bottom of the yoke, that's where that line would be. Where if, if you had a shallower um, pattern and you wanted to put the short rows at the base of that yoke, you'd also be taking into consideration some decreases. But basically that line is coming up um, to your neck. So if you're putting them around the neck, you basically have like 75% of your neck have the longest uh, short rows and then the back of the neck has is where the shortest ones are so i can kind of draw you a picture of how that um, how that works around the neck so some people on the neck want it um, so if you have um let's see let's let me draw the yoke like let me just draw the yoke like this and then you have your ribbing inside here, like that. So some people are putting the short rows here at the, around the bottom, back and forth. And some people are putting them in the actual fabric right at the edge of the, um, of the yoke. So if you have a solid color before you start your pattern stitching, then you would leave like the front quarter of the neck without short rowing and you would short row back and forth here and leave and having all of the short rows across the back of the neck. So you could do that like say you had your main color was a blue and then you had a, a pattern uh, for your yoke you could do these short rows in stockinette in that blue color. So you'd have more depth of that blue color at the back of the neck. The alternative is that you could do it in the ribbing instead. 
so that you could work your ribbing so that it was deeper in the back. But let's take a look. Let's say here is the center front and here is the center back. So if we drew all of the, the neck, so this is the center back or center uh, front on here. And this is the center back. So you have about a quarter of the stitches of the neck. This is the back, uh, center back. Um, and then you have the, your sides right here. So this is a quarter, this is a quarter, this is a quarter. And then you have this part in the front. So this is an eighth and this is an eighth. So you're going to work your short rows across this span of the stitches. And you're going to every, all of the, you're going to get every row of those short rows across the back of the neck. And the, the final turning, uh, the longest row is going to be across here. So again, you figure out how many rows you need. If you need eight rows of it, you're going to have, um, this is going to be your uh, uh, turning point here, and this is going to be a turning point here. And then you'd need two other ones uh, in between. So you just divide those evenly among um, this span right here, and that's going to give you the height that you need in the back. Um, as well as some of the, the slope that you need along the shoulders, but it will leave the neck um, lower uh, than the back. So this is specifically for a yoke type of sweater. Raglans often have um, some shaping, like you're working flat uh, at the beginning in order to drop the neckline. Uh, and so you might not need that as much with a raglan as you would with a yoke, which is going to be start with that circle around there that you need to add that height. So again, it's an aesthetic thing. Does it, does it appeal to you to have the ribbing be higher? Does it appeal to you to have um, that solid color uh, before the yoke be at the back? Or would you rather hide it at the base of the yoke where it's not really obvious if you have complete stockinette um, there? So again, knitting in the old way um, has some nice ways of looking at formulas that are pretty, pretty reasonable. Um, let me turn back to face only again. So um, I've got some, I've talked about these reference books um, many times. Oh, I didn't actually go look and see what they have in the Vogue, but Principles of Knitting by June Hemmons Hyatt is one that has, she's got a pretty big section on short rows that kind of explains how, how to lay things out. Um, and uh, Monty Stanley's book, I think this is out of print, but you can still get it used. Um, it's called Knitter's Handbook. It's my favorite uh, reference for that. And I, again, I, I didn't look through the Vogue knitting. I know they've got short rows in here, um, but I can't tell you how good that section is because I, I, I didn't remember to look through it before uh, the live stream. So uh, let's see, let me go look at some of the questions here. So, how and where do I add short rows to a pattern if the neckline is the same both back and front and I want to change it to, how do I read the rest of this? Change it to a deeper front neck, many things. Um, so that's what that neck shaping is for. When people talk about they want to raise the neck of a yoke sweater, that's what they're talking about. They're talking about those short rows uh, to raise it. And so you can either, if you have some um, plain color before you start your patterning, you can uh, do that kind of 25 uh, to 75% um, distribution of your short rows. And that will raise the neck a little bit. If it's not enough, you can always add some more, possibly in the back, to help add some more length to um, the back as well. Somebody was asking about, about that in one of the questions, um, that they had done the short rows that were, that were listed in the, in the pattern, but then they tried to add more to the back. I just messed up my hair. <laughs> um, and they got messed up. So it, it really depends on what it is you're trying to add and, and how much of it you want to add. So what I've been showing is that there's like one section where you want to get all of the rows and maybe the, the rest of it you're tapering out. But that may not be what you want. 
So in vintage patterns from like the, oh, the 1930s and the 40s, um, what they used to do is, let's see, let's do this again. What they used to do in the 30s and 40s was that they would plan out, they didn't do bust darts, but they had very close fitting sweaters. And so they would plan the front so that it was an inch wider and it was an inch longer than the back. So this might be 14 inches up to the underarm, but they were also knitting in pieces um, and seaming it. So the, the front might be uh, 14 inches long, but the back might only be 13 inches long. And what they would do when they were seaming these two together is they would just gradually ease it in. So, you know, you're gonna have maybe an extra, if you're working at a fine gauge, like fingering weight, you might have an extra 10 rows on this side of the sweater compared to this one. So you would just, you know, every so often, you would work an extra row in the seam from the one side than you would work from the other, and that would just gradually ease it in. But a lot of people are, you are knitting these uh, circular, seamless sweaters, and so how, what would you do for that? Well, you could do short rows. In that case, if you wanted length for the entire uh, front or the entire back, uh, and you didn't want to have these kind of uh, gradually uh, shorter short rows or gradually longer, but you wanted them to go across the entire back, is to just space them out every couple of inches go from all the way across, um, just do a short row. As, as you're going around, stop at the side seam, go back, and then continue on. And you could just do that every couple of inches, and that would gradually add more length to the entire back or the entire front, um, depending on what it, where it was that you wanted to add length. So you don't have to do this gradually longer and longer short rows or gradually shorter and shorter. As long as you are spacing these out, um, you can add them that way as well. Okay, let's see. So best short rows for back neck of sweater and for bust darts of sweater. So here's the thing. When you are saying for a sweater, what kind of sweater do you mean? Are you talking about a yoke sweater or are you talking about something that, that there you ha are knitting the front and back part separately and seaming it? Um, but in either case, I don't think there is a best. There, all of the techniques work equally well. You may not get as good a result with one versus another. So I, that's what swatching does for you. You practice and you see, well, which one do I like doing? Which one can I remember? That was always key for me. Which can I remember? Which can I actually execute successfully? Um, and which one do I like the result of? So sometimes one might be more fiddly than another, but you really like the result, so you feel like it's worth the fiddliness. Um, for me, I like German short rows whenever possible because they're easy, they're visible on the needle, I can see where the last turn was. And I, when it's time to work across uh, the stitches, I can see where that double stitch is. So that is why I really like German short rows. But a lot of people like other kinds of short row techniques. It just depends um, on what you like. So there really isn't, I don't think, a best. Okay, so I tried a short a wrap heel that used wraps and turns and it looked terrible, I think because of the double wraps. So, um, it turns out it looked terrible, I think because of the double wraps, any tips? So the double, you know, I, I never liked wrap and turn short rows. When I found German short rows in this German book, it was called um, 
It's called the Big Book of Knitting. It's translated from Germany. And I saw that short row technique. I was looking for short row techniques. I wanted to compare them all. And every American book had wrap and turn short rows. Sometimes they might have had one other type of short row technique, but the German book had a yarn over short row and it had this other kind of short row technique, but they didn't call them that. They just described them. One was shortened rows with yarn over needle and the other one was called shortened rows with stitches pulled over needle, something like that. And so they were just described and that was the, the technique that that I fell in love with it, that this is so much easier. Why isn't everybody using this? It's not, it wasn't in any of the books. And so that was when I, I wrote an article for this week in Ravelry. Ravelry used to have a newsletter and I had a little column on there and I uh, demonstrated that short row technique. And I just called it German short rows because it was from a German book and I couldn't find it anywhere else. I didn't know what to call it. So some people call it double stitch short rows. So for me, it's the easiest technique. The thing about a short row heel is that you are stacking short rows. So when you, when you return to that turning point in the short row, you aren't knitting past it. You are wrapping it again if you're using wrap and turn short rows. So you have to pick up the double wraps and it's really hard. Traditionally, the way German short rows were used in, in uh, socks was to use what they call the boomerang heel, which is another way of saying a short row heel. But they would work the first half of the heel, and then they would work two rounds, and then they would work the second half of the heel. So because the German short row turn, you can stack those turns on top of each other, but it's kind of messy and it's harder. Uh, other short row turns are, are equally tricky that way. Shadow wraps are kind of tricky that way. Uh, you don't have to work two rounds. You can set things up so that you are working two rows just across the heel stitches to separate those. And for me, I found that easier. You can even do that with wrap and turn short rows where you work half of the heel uh, with wrap and turn and then work a couple of rounds if you wanted of, of stitches and picking up those wraps as you go and then doing your second set of wrap and turn. So you don't have to double wrap even when you are using wrap and turn short rows. There are other options. So I do have a video. Uh, it's called German Short Rows Three Ways. And I explain that whole uh, construction of what's called the hourglass heel, which is the first half of the heel gets shorter and shorter, and then the second half gets wider and wider. So it forms kind of this hourglass. And I explain how that's constructed and the ways that you can uh, divide up the heel and separate the two halves if you want. So you could do that with wrap and turn. If you're comfortable with wrap and turn otherwise, and you just as soon use that method, uh, you can do your heel in a different way um, than that. How do you measure short rows for a dowager's hump? I, here's how I, this is, this is the way I would approach it. I don't know if this is correct. <laughs> uh, I would measure um, how long the back need, need to be from the shoulders down the, down the side. So that might need to be the same length as, as you need for the front. And it could be that you just need more, more uh, shaping for the center of the back. Um, but I, I don't know for sure. I don't really know anatomically, and it might vary from person to person. Um, but look in the, in, across the, the actual measure, the length that you need uh, from the back of the neck all the way down and then see what you need from the shoulders all the way down. So, uh, and then see how, you know, what the difference is in that length. So when you, um, let me go into the overhead again. So it's like any of these, any of these problems, if you have, you know, you know, you need your sweater to be long, uh, this long right here, but maybe you need um, more length up here than you would just for like normal um, shoulder shaping. If you figure, just figure out how long you need it here. And there might be a couple of spots, I really don't know, uh, that, you, that you might need to measure and what the longest amount is. So you know what has to have the most short rows 
and you know what needs the least amount of short rows. And so you can, you can plan if you, if you have this needs all of the short rows, um, then you can plan it that way. Um, and again, it depends on the kind of sweater you're knitting too. Uh, if you're knitting something that's, um, has a shoulder seam, it might be a little bit easier because you could use like sewing construction theory instead of trying to deal with the, the yoke construction. Um, but that, that's what I would try is to see if there are different horizontal points across the back and see like what the length of difference is that you need for each of those sections. So you might have uh, a couple of sections where you need to add length in, in different parts in order to make things kind of even out so it doesn't um, scoop up at the bottom. Again, I don't know for sure that that's going to work, but that's, that's the way I would think about it is, you know, find some horizontal lines and figure out what the vertical distance is between those horizontal lines and then figure out how to fill that in uh, with short rows. Would you ever consider making a video on German short row toes? I'm specifically interested in cuff down. I'm wondering if knitting plain rounds or rows at the midpoint would be a problem. Okay, so I'm just, okay, I understand what you're saying. I think you could still do the rows. So the way that works in, um, and if you've ever done like a fish li lips kiss heel that uses shadow wraps and she uses these plain rows in the middle. So a, the way a short row heel, and this would be true for a short row uh, toe as well, the way it, it normally works is you're working shorter and shorter and then you just go to longer and longer. So rather than making your first turns at the very edges, make them a stitch in from there. And so that when you get to this center part here, you can work all the way across and do your short row turn that you would have done right there and come back and do that short row turn that you would have done there. Uh, and then you could come back to here and do that. So that's in that video, that German short rows heels three ways. I would use that technique where you're working um, the rows in the center that can interrupt it. Because even when you're doing a heel, it can be disruptive to create rounds in the middle if you're doing something like with a self-striping yarn and you don't want like a random set of stripes or that you don't want the color sequence to get interrupted, um, then you can use those uh, rows in the middle. That's, that's my preference for working uh, German short row heels, either that or um, working it so that you work the second half, instead of doing a double stitch, you just slip that stitch. So there, there are a couple of different um, ways of doing that. Let's see. How do short rows affect your patterns design? I'm not sure what that means. Okay, um, how do you work short rows when there is an intricate design as in cables or lace? Lace is trickier. I do have an example um, for cables, um, which I can show you. I have another sweater. So let's show you this one. So this is an example where I was working a cable pattern and I had short row shoulder shaping. So I needed to, um, well, in, in this case, it was just ribbing right here. There weren't any cables, but it works the same um, with cables as well, where typically what you're doing is you might divide up and you might decide, well, I need to make my turns every 10, every 10 stitches or every five stitches. You, you have this equally divided way of doing things. Um, but you don't have to. 
you can um, move them over a little bit. So make one of them a little longer and one of them a little shorter so that you can make your turns in a purl column. Some types of cables, uh, you can um, do a short row in the middle of them. So this type of cable uh, where you're just crossing every six or eight rows or whatever, you could do a short row turn in the middle of one of those. And it, that, because it's all stockinette, it wouldn't be that noticeable that, that you had done the short row turn. Traveling cables where you have those ropes of two stockinette stitches and are traveling across a background of uh, purl stitches and they're, things are crossing every row, that can be a little bit trickier and that's really a case by case situation where you have to look at, um, at, <laughs> at what's happening and how can I juggle that. Sometimes it just gets, it's really complicated and depending on where your short rows are, so that if it was a lace pattern and I needed to do this kind of short row shaping, that's a situation where I would probably do bind offs and instead of short rows and I'd have that stair step and I would just seam it just because that would be the easiest uh, way to resolve the, the problem. So it really depends on what kind of uh, situation. I think texture patterns can be easier than, oops, than, um, like color patterns, those can be really hard. Um, those are really hard. Uh, but texture patterns, depending on what the row repeats are and what, what's happening, you can um, do it. But there's no like standard method of doing it. It's like laying it out and trying to look at where you need those turns to be. Can I start him a row or two earlier? Will that be more convenient? Can I shift him over a little bit one way or the other? It's really, you know, that's really the approach and it's sort of a one by one situation. Okay, Anita says a couple of words about Japanese short rows. Well, when I learned Japanese short rows, well, when I learned the German short row technique, I had been struggling with Japanese short rows because it just seems so fiddly. The, the ones where you put the little uh, clip on the back, I, you put like a clip for every turn and then you use it to lift it up to the needle. So the one, there's one type of, short, of Japanese short row that is identical to German short rows. They produce exactly the same result. I have um, a video on a fixing like a drop double stitch, like for German short rows, if you lose your, the double stitch, how do you fix it? And what I point out is that it's exactly like a Japanese short row and on a Japanese short row, the way you turn is you turn and slip a stitch. When you return to that turning point, you're lifting a strand of yarn onto the needle. That strand of yarn is the same piece of yarn that is the double, the second strand of yarn for a double stitch. So those two are exactly alike. There is another apparently type of, people are labeling, labeling it Japanese short rows. Um, and maybe, maybe they are, I don't know, it's a little bit different. And I saw in um, this book, this Monty Stanley book a couple of weeks ago, she has a short row technique in there that appears to be the same as that other type of Japanese short row. Um, she doesn't call it that. Um, and I tried it out and I, I find it a way more fiddly. <laughs> so for me, it's like, what gives me the best result and what's the easiest? And for me, I really liked the, the result of a Japanese short row, but I could never stand the tediousness of getting through it. And um, so that's why I like German short rows, but I don't, I don't know what, what else to say about Japanese short rows, that there are two kinds. I think Tech Knitter's blog, I think the type that she has is the other type of, of uh, Japanese short row. Let's see, let me go back up and some of the early questions. I'm gonna, okay, let's see. 
Okay, so um, let's talk a little bit about the longer and longer short rows and shorter and shorter um, short rows. So let me go back overhead. So when we were talking about this heel, um, we were talking about getting shorter and shorter and then longer and longer. And what it's doing in, in a short row heel is, I work this, you can work these in either direction, is that you start with half of the sock stitches and you get shorter and shorter. So that is creating something that that goes away from the horizontal. It goes up from the horizontal of these original long rows. And when you look at rows that are getting longer and longer, they are getting, they are heading toward the horizontal. So when you pair these together, that's when you get something that comes up uh, from the tube. If you are only doing one of these, and you are doing them near an edge, that's how you can create an edge that goes out this way and will stay flat is by doing uh, shorter and shorter short rows. Where if you um, cast on and you start with short, shorter short rows and you get longer and longer and longer, then you can create something that swoops down at the edge. So I have a shawl here somewhere. <clears throat> So this uh, crisscross shawl, this is one of my patterns, but um, this is a situation where in the center it's, um, it's deeper and so the idea is that this part is going straight and this edge here is swooping down. So that's why you start with the shorter short rows and it keeps these rows of stitches horizontal as you are making them longer and longer. It causes this to curve up, but it keeps all of these uh, horizontal going up like that. Now there are situations where you might break that rule of trying to keep things horizontal. So we were talking earlier about a yoke, like doing the ribbing for um, a yoke sweater to add length and so my friend Joan Schrouder, she does her um, yoke sweaters with ribbing um, where she does the short rows and the ribbing. Well, this is a little lopsided, but so that the, so that the ribbing is longer back here than it is in the front. So typically what you would do is you'd pick around, you'd pick up stitches around that neck opening and then you would be you know, working out, you'd be working away from the opening. And if you were going to be doing something like that, if this was where the pickup line here, and you wanted these, um, this to be longer, and you were kind of going away from this edge, you would think that you would do the, these um, shorter and shorter and shorter like this. But the problem with, with doing shorter and shorter short rows like that, you have to go back around to create one final long row before you bind off. And when you do that, you're going by all of these turns. You, you have to pass by all of those turns right at the bind off edge. And that can make things look a little bit bumpy. So what Joan does is that after she picks up the stitches, she starts with the shorter short rows and she gets longer and longer because every time she's making it longer, she's going past those turns and they are next to the body of the sweater. So by the time she's ready to go around the entire neck, it's very smooth and so that bind off edge will be very smooth. So that was a case where I thought, well that, that's a really interesting solution to the issue of having the bumps. So it, there, like I, there's advantages and disadvantages to any technique. And so it depends on what it is aesthetically that you're trying um, to do. So I hope that answered that question. Okay.
When you do a German short row, how tightly do you pull the yarn to make the double stitch? Does the double stitch sit on top of the needle? Uh, yes, you, uh, you pull it until the double stitch is on, you, you want the double stitch to be on top of the needle. So you're pulling it um, just enough so that that, that place where you see, so that you, yeah, you can see the double stitch on top of the needle. Um, if you look at, you know, I've got tons of videos where, I, where I'm, use, I'm doing German short rows, so you can kind of see uh, what it looks like. Some people pull super tight and some people are pulling too loosely. So uh, what I would do if I were you, I would do some swatches and do like three swatches. One where you're pulling super tight, uh, one where you just pull that double stitch just until you see it, it's on top of the needle. There's kind of um, like a, a loop where there's like a single uh, strand just meeting the double strand. Put that one right on top. Work some sets of short rows that way and see what that looks like. And then you can do one where maybe you do it a little bit looser each time and see which one gives you the best result and see if, if it's different when you are doing them when you're doing a turn on a right side row versus doing a turn um, on a wrong side row and see if you need to finesse your te technique a little bit but that's really the way to do it is just kind of analytically go through and say well here's what I'm doing this time and make sure that you're doing it that way every time you're pulling the stitch over and then compare it to what happens if I do it this other way. Oh, Sandra, thank you so much. Um, well, okay, so can um, short row stitches be stacked as in a heel situation? Well, the heel is a short row, um, so they can be stacked. It depends on what it is you're trying to do. <laughs> So uh, typically, um, you know, the short row heel is a very specific situation where you are um, doing things, you know, pretty quickly and dramatically, and you're trying to achieve this, this look that really raises up out of the surface of the rest of the fabric. So you can stack things like that, but again, it depends on the short row technique that you're using, whether or not stacking works very well or whether you're better off working a few rows in between them uh, if you need to do multiple sets. And I also talked about that, the little bird that I made um, where they absolutely were turned at exactly the same point each time deliberately in order to make a very fast curve uh, where the tips of my fingers are, but um, but where my palm is, that would be where the turn was done every time and it was for a decorative effect. It would, it would look weird in most situations, but it was for a very specific decorative purpose. So when you have questions like this, like, well, can you do this or can you do that? Try it. Do a swatch. What happens if I stack short rows? And if it almost, if, if your idea sort of works, but not quite, see if you can figure out uh, what's causing it, what happens if I put a couple of plain rows in between, and then I do that, what happens? So whatever you have an idea, trust yourself, trust your instinct, and try out your, try out your idea. I can't tell you how many times I've woken up at five in the morning and thought, oh, I know, I can do this, and I go and try it, and I'm like, oh, that didn't work at all. And then other time, but why didn't it work? Oh, I see, the thing like I couldn't imagine in my head didn't work. So um, sometimes things work out and sometimes as you're trying to do the thing that you thought of, you realize that's not going to work, but you, you find a different solution that does work. So swatching is really, I can't recommend it enough. Oh, it's already after five. So I'm going to, I'm going to answer one more question and I'm going to keep all of these, the chat will remain and I'm going to mind them uh, for future technique video ideas because I think there's just so many questions that people uh, have 
about uh, short rows that um, I just it just can't answer everything um, it, at one time. So let's see. So I, if anybody has any other suggestions for uh, what kinds of questions I, that maybe I can't answer today, but that you would like to see answered in a future short row video, Technique Tuesday video, um, you can let me know. And so if the live stream ends and you can't add it to the chat, you can always add it to the comments of the video itself. So this has uh, been recorded and it will be saved and it will be um, on my YouTube channel. And I will put this in the playlist for uh, along with my other short row videos. So I thank all of you for coming today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much.